بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشهد الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله So this is uh, our fourth class of purification of the heart الحمد لله We've uh, covered I believe the first maybe five or six diseases, but we've got quite a few to go. So we're going to try to cover a lot more today, inshallah, and move through some of these quicker. Um, and there are shorter uh, shorter sections here. So uh, we're going to start with, inshallah, blameworthy modesty on page 36. So let's go ahead and get to that section. And again... Um, as we have been, we'll read from the actual poem and then jump into the discussion. Bismillah. So verses 67 to 72 of Blameworthy Modesty. As for blameworthy modesty, it is that which prevents one from denouncing the condemnable or, form, or from asking a question concerning a matter relating to religion and the like. For this reason, it is considered a harmful quality. As for noble modesty, it is such as the chosen one's behavior the night he married Zainab, when he fed his company to their full from his wedding feast, and they all left except for three. They lingered, yet he did not request that they leave. Such modesty is a most excellent virtue. Had modesty been a person, it would have been a righteous one and would do nothing but good in whatever it did. So, <clears throat> blameworthy modesty. Uh, again, this is um, whenever you are prevented uh, from your own, you know, trepidation, hesitation, shyness of asking important questions that affect you, that affect your spiritual growth, uh, or acting, you know, in in uh, in a situation that requires action, right? So if, if your own if you stand in your own way because you're too worried about maybe your image or uh, you know other people's view of you, uh, then you won't act right. So there's this res you know it's it's a lack of courage basically right. So if you read again in the definition here, in general modesty is something praised in Islam and is considered virtuous. Modesty becomes blameworthy if it prevents one from Denouncing what clearly should be denounced, such as tyranny or corruption. So if you see an injustice, something happening in front of you, let's say in your, um, you know, workspace or at school, you know, we have to teach children, right? Uh, and there's obviously, you know, with wisdom, not every situation, uh, you don't have to be reactive necessarily. We're not talking about reactivity. We're talking about at least having a response, and that response can take time to, to, to form. You know, you might uh, go back and deliberate, get advice and think about it. And then you might go back and say, you know what, I need to speak up. This injustice uh, is not acceptable. Um, I don't agree with it. So this is wisdom, right? But the fact that, you know, that, that it's important to do that instead of just remaining silent or turning a blind eye, uh, that's what blameworthy modesty is. And usually the reason why people do that is because they're prioritizing something else above the, the right, you know, course of action. And uh, it's likely they're, uh, they're prioritizing themselves, right? The ego is involved here. There's either, um, you know, a concern, again, about image, reputation. I don't want to, you know, compromise maybe my position uh, or my status with people. I don't want people to not like me, right? We, we definitely have a problem with... Um, you know, people pleasing to to the point where we can actually, you know, look away when something is happening, right? That that should should uh, that requires people to step in and say that's not right. And unfortunately, you know, we see this now all the time on social media, right? It's a horrible, uh, you know, epidemic. I would say because it's there, it's happening all the time where people are uh, on their phones and they're recording grave injustices happening right in front of them but they're not willing to put themselves on the line. They're not willing to get in front of the camera, right? Because to get in front of the camera is to put yourself out there to be vulnerable. People can identify you, people can see you. Um, or maybe you don't want to get attacked, 
physically you're scared, right? There's a fear that I'm going to get injured some way, but you are willing still to watch, right? That, that's disturbing. And so we definitely see a problem with that, right? Um, and then there's a chapter here, which is important, again, to, to, to consider. There must be agreement, however, among scholars on what is condemnable. One cannot, for example, declare decisively that something is considered condemnable if there is a difference of opinion on it among the scholars. Uh, scholars no knowledgeable of the plentitude of juristic differences rarely condemn others. They refrain from such condemnation, not because of modesty, but because of their extensive knowledge and scholarly insight. Unfortunately, many people today are swift to condemn, which creates another disease, self-righteousness. This is very important. Because we can't just um, take matters into our own hands. You know, everybody has an opinion these days, and everybody thinks that they uh, know what is really right and what is really wrong. And when you do that, this is, you know, a form of like, you know, like vigilantism, right? It's like I'm just going to take justice into my own hands and do what I think is right. And this is not part of our dean. We have, you know, we have to look and defer to those who are amongst us who can help us understand if something truly deserves to be um, condemned or not. And so we defer to the experts with regards to, to, to that. Um, and, uh, you know, the mention of, of you know, self-righteousness is also important to reflect on, you know, personally. Like, think about it. Do you, um, when you are condemning something, is it more about right and wrong or is it a feeling of superiority, right? This is where you can actually see whether or not, you know, this disease of the heart is misplaced, right? That you are, um, that you're, you know, or that your, your concern or that your, um, you know, outrage over an issue, is it, is it, is it really because the issue is wrong or is it more that it makes you feel good to be on, you know, the finger wagger, you know, like the one who wags the finger and, and is uh, condemning other people because a lot of people, now enjoy that, especially, right, if you look at social media, uh, this is where we see it happening a lot. There's a lot of critics, a lot of people who think they know what's right and wrong, and they're, you know, we have a cancel culture, you know, as soon as someone makes a mistake, it's like, let's tear them down. Uh, where does this come from? It comes from this disease of self-righteousness, right? Um, so there, it's tied in there, but it's mentioned for that reason. And then he goes on to say, the blameworthy modesty results in timid failure to denounce what unequivocally deserves denouncement or to ask about important matters from those who are knowledgeable. Um, and this is, you know, regarding, um, you know, knowledge acquisition. It's so important, especially for us uh, as women uh, and children, you know, in our community, for us to be able to empower, uh, you know, certain groups to be able to speak up because sometimes it seems that, you know, um, that, that we don't have, we're not encouraged to do that as often. And so you see that, uh, you know, happening a lot where uh, people just because they're afraid to speak up or they've been told or conditioned to think that they shouldn't speak up, right, that they don't uh, ask the necessary questions. Um, and then, you know, if you're left to your own devices or thoughts, you might come up to your own conclusions about certain things or get the wrong information. So when you have an opportunity to ask, um, it's so encouraged to ask. And that's why this hadith of, that Aisha uh, related um, is so important. The best women were the women of the Ansar because modesty did not prevent them from learning the religion. Um, a woman once came to the Prophet and I'm asking a specific question about menstruation. So again, let's think about that for a second. You know, how likely would that ever happen in our community nowadays, right? Uh, can you imagine uh, a woman feeling empowered enough that if she was really curious about her cycle, that she would actually openly go to the imam, you know, or a leader, a male leader, and ask a question? Most likely not, right? And it's because we are, again, culturally conditioned to think that certain questions are not right to ask, it's not appropriate, but if it's affecting your practice of the deen, um, and it's really serious, then you do have to ask, right? And not worry about, oh, how am I going to look? People are going to laugh at me. People are going to think I'm weird. I'm awkward. You know, that concern of, of what people are going to say, uh, 
is, is secondary. It's not, it's not important. It's more a matter of if it's affecting your practice of your faith, that's, you know, that's a priority and you should get, seek clarification. And of course, there's ways to do it, um, you know, where you can still uh, be subtle about it. But the fact that it happened so openly, uh, you know, and, and with the Provost Lysenum tells us that we should feel empowered to ask whenever we, we need clarification. Um, welcome to all who, who came on to that. So we're on page 37, and we're talking about blameworthy modesty. Uh, we're on the second paragraph. And then the, the imam then speaks on the third paragraph about virtuous modesty, which is rooted in generosity and kindness. And this is an acceptable kind of modesty. Right? And he uses the example of when the Prophet said, I married Zainab, and how, you know, it's typical. You have a feast, you have guests over, and some uh, of the attendees lingered, right? Three in particular. And he tried to give them hints, like, okay, we're, it's getting late. Um, you know, and I've been, I'm sure we've all had situations like that, right? Uh, where it's past midnight, you're yawning excessively. Um, I've, I know people who've actually gone and, and dressed in their pajamas, <laughs> like to really give a clue, like a hint, like, okay, it's really late, right? We need to, we need to end this. But sometimes people are so excited, you know, and they're happy and they're, you know, maybe they're night owls, you know, and they don't really look at time like that. It's just like, hey, we're all talking, everything's, um, you know, flowing, why, why end a good night? But they're not realizing that they might be, you know, um, imposing on someone. But if you don't speak up and you still entertain your guests and you're still gracious, this would be a, a noble quality and a prophetic quality because this is what, exactly what the Prophet did. Okay. So he talks, he just gives you that difference to know the difference between the two. Um, and then there's a section that's also important. This verse applies, I mean, um, on, the, on page 38 at the end of, of that top paragraph, it says this verse, and the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse when that whole incident happened, right? It's chapter 33, verse 53. Believers, when you are invited, then enter. And when you have completed the meal, disperse and do not linger on for conversation. This used to hurt the Prophet that he shied away from telling you, but God is not shy of the truth. So that's just, you know, general nasiha that um, we should, you know, have adab when we're visiting people and be mindful, you know, of their situation. If they have children, if they have to work the next day. Some people have early shifts and they have to be up, you know, or they might have health issues. So this is more for us to reflect on when we're in those situations to make sure that we're being uh, cognizant of these things. But the, you know, then he go, it says that this verse applies in particular to visiting people whose obligations and time constraints are greater than others, such as statesmen and scholars. They may also feel shy about cutting visits short when they are the hosts. So if you're ever in a position of, um, you know, visiting with high-level people, um, even if they're very gracious and generous and offering, uh, because that's sunnah and if they want to honor you, you should know that that is, that is not an invitation to uh, overextend, you know, the time with them and overstay. But rather, it's just they're showing this beautiful modesty and your adab should be to say, thank you for the time you've given me, but we're, I'm not going to, um, as they say, milk it, right? We're not, I'm not going to linger here and stay and over, overstay my welcome. So it's just general nasiha, to be mindful of people uh, in those positions. And I would also add to that, anybody who's working, again, um, in high pressure, high stress jobs, if you know that that's their situation where they have very limited time on the weekends or, you know, to socialize, um, that even if you enjoy their company, to uh, prefer them over yourself because it's likely that they're working long shifts during the week and their time is very special, right? Uh, you know, their free time and they covet that time. So you don't want to take too much of that. Um, and, and I would say as Ramadan is, you know, nearing, we should really think about this because I know, and I've heard so many complaints over the years of people being in those really difficult situations when iftar, you know, is served and they want to get to the masjid, but people are still socializing, you know, and their kids are running around and everybody's talking and they're like, oh, you know, they're prevented from going to the masjid and they feel shy to say to, to their guests, like, okay, it's time to wrap it up. 
right? Because people are at different levels. There are some people who are very like scheduled, and it's like as soon as iftar is over, I'm making wudu, I'm out the door. And then there's other people who are kind of like, ah, today, I don't know, I'm not, you know, I'm a little tired. I might just stay back. So if you have guests that are of a, you know, from all these different backgrounds, you are going to likely be in a situation where you do have some people who are uh, like you, ready to leave and, and really take their time, especially in Ramadan, very seriously, or, or others who just kind of are lingering and, and enjoying the company. So how do you handle that situation? Let let us reading you know these verses and, and this advice just be mindful to say, even if it's so nice, you know I'm, I'm chatting with people I haven't seen in a while, you know, and sometimes we are we're invited to to these bigger iftars where it's like. You get to see people in the community you might not regularly see that you have to prefer the um, the needs of the host. I just actually recently wrote an entire Facebook post on the adab of visiting people, and this was mentioned. And I do encourage people, just as general, like if you're invited somewhere and they don't tell you when the end time is, because you know invite starts at seven, six thirty. That's usually how it goes. Nobody likes to impose, or, or you know put an end time because it just seems restrictive but we should ask like what when do you you know what time do you want to end it by let me know because that way you get a good sense of are you uh, at someone's home who's like hey stay around for as long as you want we can go to you know two three in the morning if you guys are up for it or if you're you know dealing with someone who's actually much more scheduled and wants to you know end it at, a, at a, a have a cutoff time but if you ask it takes that pressure off of them so this is just a good practice of showing consideration to your hosts and also giving them that space to be able to say, yeah, I, I would actually prefer if we can show, you know, start winding down around this time. It's just a nice, you know, mutually respectful way of, of handling an otherwise awkward situation, right? Okay. <clears throat> All right, alhamdulillah. So any questions about... Um, blameworthy modesty before we go on. And I, I mentioned for those of you who walked in a little late that because we're kind of behind, we're going to try to move the, through these quickly, but I, I don't want to deter you from asking questions if you have any. Um, so let me just look at my notes here. Oh, yeah, so the, the cure for this, right, because we also want to know how to, if we have this, um, how to protect ourselves or, or, or overcome it is to practice more courage and to remember to always prioritize the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Before yourself, before what other people, you know, pleasing other people, we should always aim to seek to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every situation. And when you have that lens, then it should, you know, give you the courage to speak up in, in times where, where you would otherwise maybe, you know, just stay a little quiet. Um, there's a hadith uh, reported by Qurra ibn Ilyas he reported that we were once with the Prophet wasallam when modesty was mentioned to him and they said O Messenger of Allah is modesty part of faith and the Prophet said rather, rather it is the entire religion then he said verily modesty abstinence reticence of the tongue but not the heart and deeds are all part of faith. They bring gain in the hereafter and loss in the world. What is gained in the hereafter is much greater than what is missed in the world. So, alhamdulillah, that's a, a pretty, again, you know, great message about just how all of those things um, benefit us, right, in the long run. That even if we uh, might suffer a little bit of shyness or embarrassment in a situation momentarily, in the long run, there's great benefit. And that's how you have to look at blameworthy modesty, that I, I, I need to overcome my uh, hesitance or, or shyness because um, it might be uncomfortable socially for a few minutes or moments, but at least I will, I'm will. i putting the pleasure of Allah before myself, and in the long run that benefits me. Yes? Oh, sure, from that hadith? Oh, sure. Okay, I can repeat that. The question was to repeat the quality so they he said that verily modesty abstinence 
reticence of the tongue but not the heart, and deeds are all part of faith. They bring gain in the hereafter and loss in the world. What is gained in the hereafter is much greater than what is missed in the world. All right, so the next uh, section is on page 39, fantasizing. Um, so we'll read from verses 73 to 74. The heart's engagement in matters that do not concern it is only forbidden when it pertains to the prohibited, such as fantasizing about the beautiful qualities of a woman, and I would add, you know, as a, or a man, right? Um, it goes both ways or dwelling on the faults of Muslims, even in their absence. Okay. So the next disease is when one's heart is engaged in matters that are of no concern to him. Again, um, for, for example, reflecting on things that are prohibited, such as lustful fantasizing. So um, fantasizing can occur in three different situations. Again, the first one is lustful fantasizing, and this can work both ways um, between uh, men and women, right? Just thinking about someone, uh, coveting someone that is not uh, for you, especially if you're already, um, you know, married or, or in a relationship, this would be even worse. But um, just having those thoughts about someone is completely forbidden. And even, you know, this is common, I think, knowledge and in, in across all, you know, uh, traditions. But the Catholic um, tradition actually teaches and I thought this was just you know worthwhile to mention that everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart, right? Um, and so just considering that, and it's similar to to the view of, of you know adultery of the eyes, right? In Islam, we have that concept that you can adultery comes in many forms, right? Um, and you can have that with even just your eyes by thinking and uh, about things that are inappropriate. So that would be one um, disease, or or you know or example of, of this disease. Another is imagining or thinking about the faults of other, of, of other people, right? Um, and sometimes we can let our thoughts get carried away, our suspicions get carried away when we think of maybe people we don't like or someone we're having you know, problems with. But we just, you know, we kind of sit in that, um, you know, those thoughts and, and think really bad thoughts and negative thoughts maybe based on if, actual events or, or negative experiences with them, and maybe not. But the Prophet ﷺ said that um, there is a tree in paradise reserved for people whose own faults preoccupied them from considering the faults of others. So that's, you know, that's how we should look at it. Like, instead of stewing and thinking about other people's bad qualities, and then, which often leads to another horrible, or even worse action, which is riba, right? We don't usually just stay in our own thoughts when we have negative thoughts about people. We want to share those thoughts. And now you're getting yourself in trouble, you're getting someone else in trouble because they're culpable once they start listening to that. So it's just, it's all toxic, right? Um, but why not shift the focus back on yourself? We have plenty of uh, our own wrong actions and faults and, and things that we can think about. So it's just a really... Um, good advice in terms of, 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 uh, of helping one with overcome that, that disease of always wanting to think about the negative attributes of other people. Just bring it back to yourself. Um, and then the third example of fantasizing as problematic, as prohibited. So we have lustful fantasizing, thinking about the faults of other people. The third one is to fantasize about the nature of God's essence, right? Uh, this, um, you know, causes a lot of problems. Um, because whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed about himself is clear to us. We have the, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know. But in terms of going beyond that, right, and, and trying to um, answer questions that you'll never be able to answer, it's literally impossible to answer uh, questions about the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It causes problems. And then, you know, sometimes you have people... Um, opening those discussions, you know, with other people who might not have given things any thought, but now there's doubt in someone else's mind. So you got to think about, you know, is it wise? What, what's the benefit? What's the benefit of talking about matters that are not, um, you, we, we don't have answers to? They only cause suspicion, and it's like an inroad. It's how, 
you know, this is how shaitan distracts us from our purpose by getting us caught up in thoughts that are um, that are not helpful and that they're they don't really have any conclusion other than to befuddle you, to confuse you, to cause you doubt, um, to cause you constriction. So that's why we don't give those thoughts wind. You know, you just kind of have to say, "All the benaim shaitan regime." I know exactly what that is. You know, there will be a day, inshallah, where our questions will be answered. And that's how you have to look at it. Like, not everything um, will be answered in this world. And there's a lot of mysteries in the universe. There's mysteries about everything, not just Allah's essence, right? Well, we're human beings. Our knowledge is limited. We have to be humble enough to admit that. We're not going to always know everything. But our deen um, and, you know, tells us that there will be a day uh, where all of the questions that we have, we will have answers to. And so we just look forward to that, you know. We're not being shut down. It's just saying time and place, right? There's a time and place, and in this abode, your knowledge is restricted. Your knowledge is limited, and there's benefits to that. I mean, there's some things that I think, if we really think about, I don't know, it's, it's frightening, you know. Like, I don't want to really think about certain things because it's too, like, you know, without having tangible... Um, or, or actual evidence or, or answers or something to like hold on to, something concrete, it does kind of, you know, spiral and take your mind somewhere else. And I'll just give you one example. Um, like black holes, right? <laughs> if you actually sit and have watched documentaries, black holes are probably one of the most terrifying things like I've ever heard of. They're, 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 it's really, you know, like what is it? It's so, but well, what's the point of, um, again, spending your time thinking about black holes? You shouldn't. I mean, we just know that they exist, and uh, I'm sure scientists have, you know, much more knowledge about exactly um, what what they are. I don't even have the language to describe them, but just what I know of them puts me in a state of, you know, constriction. But I know to just be like, okay, subhanAllah, that's just one of the, you know, an, an, another mystery of the universe, and um, alhamdulillah, one day we'll Maybe no, maybe not in this lifetime, maybe in the next lifetime. But I'm not going to, you know what I mean, spend my time, waste my time giving, um, getting myself worried. And even another topic, which I know excites because I used to be, I, I mean, I used to do a lot of work um, with, uh, with youth. I mean, I still do, but on specific topics they always wanted to talk about were like jinn, right? <laughs> jinn stories are probably one of the favorite topics of all youth. <laughs> they love to hear about jinn. But if you really um, sit and think about them too much, it's a preoccupation that distracts you, that will frighten you, that will cause you a lot of problems and paranoia. And this is how the mind is very powerful. So there's just certain things that we should not think about. And that's really the gist of the section, that there are thoughts that if you give them too much weight and wind and, you know, they'll, and run away with it, it causes you more harm. So you should have the self-restraint and the control to say, don't have those answers. That's not beneficial. I'm not going to think about that. And then move on. Okay? <clears throat> and that's a pretty short, you know, section because it's, uh, it's pretty um, self-explanatory that, you know, it's just we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't give it too much thought. All right, any questions about that section? <clears throat> oh, the cure is to, um, thank you, is to reflect on the attributes of Allah subhanahu that are already revealed to us and also to be humble enough to know your knowledge is limited. Um, Imam al-Ghazali actually <clears throat> said that the way to um, excuse me, sorry. The way to ward off distracting thoughts is to cut off their source. So you avoid the means that cre could create those thoughts. If the source of such thoughts is not stopped, then it'll keep generating them. So again, you sometimes it's your own mind, you know, looking into things, doing those searches, um, being curious, you know, going, you know what I mean, letting your suspicions sort of uh, um, take hold of you. So you have to control yourself. Sometimes it's other people. You know, you might um, have people in your life that like to dibble-dabble in conversations and matters that they shouldn't. 
and you should, um, again, I mean, tying in the previous, uh, you know, section, have not have blameworthy modesty to tell them, you know what, that's not beneficial. You know, let's not talk about that. That's a perfect example of when, you know, you should actually prevent harm, not just for yourself, but also for the other person, right? If you're talking about, for example, the attributes of Allah, and, you know, your, your friend is like, yeah, I wonder about this, and I wonder about that, and it's just not getting anywhere, one of you has to say, wait a second, you know what? There's no benefit to this. You know, alhamdulillah, Allah's already revealed exactly what he wants us to know about him. Let's not sit here and think about what he looks like and this and what, you know, all those things we don't have answers to, let's just stop. That's, you know, responsible way of handling that situation for yourself and for the other person because you don't want to, um, again, keep entertaining those thoughts and then inviting other people, oh, yeah, what do you think? What do you think? And now you have, like, five people and everybody walks away with, like, all this doubt and, and you know, and you're, you might be responsible for that. So if you're curious, you know, about something, um, either ask, uh, you know, a scholar uh, or someone who you think can help you with those questions, but certainly don't take those doubts and curiosities to public spaces and share them because this is, it's not fair to do that, you know, uh, to, to take your own burdens and then now make them the burdens of other people. That's not responsible. If you care about, you know, this, getting to the truth of the matter, then you seek the right source, and you pursue that course of knowledge, right? Uh, but you certainly don't, like I said, take those thoughts and, um, you know, give them wind and then uh, burden other people with the same dilemmas that you're having. That's just basic consideration, right? Okay. Yes. That's a very good question. So again, I'm just going to repeat it for those who are on the recording. Uh, the question was about if you have people in your life who might, you know, kind of, you know, again, um, pose certain questions or make certain comments that that uh, you reflect on later. You're not deliberately doing it. It just maybe pops into your mind, right? And so, um, but it does cause you issues. Uh, that's exactly what, what I just said. If that's the case where you start feeling constricted by something, then don't let those questions linger. Go to someone, a qualified source, and say, you know, someone mentioned this recently and I'm being bothered by it. It's like, you know, it's something that I want to, you know, get a, do you ha is there an answer for this question or is there, you know, can you explain it to me? But pursue, um, you know, the, the truth. Like, look for someone who can help you. Otherwise, you know, shaitan, that's what he does. You know, he, the waswasa is the little whisperings of doubt, the little, you know, inspirations to do wrong things, but we ha we can, you know, squash some of those things just with truth, right? If you go to someone who's, uh, who has the knowledge, they may be able to give you one simple thing that just settles all doubt. But if you leave yourself by yourself with those thoughts, they'll just mount and mount, and it's, it's a problem. So that's why, um, you know, the previous section, again, is so important to reflect on. Um, <clears throat> Ask questions. You know, if you're curious about something and it's bothering you and it's causing you those uh, problems in your faith, pursue the answer. Don't just sit with it, right? Uh, and alhamdulillah, and I, I can, I feel like when you're studying other traditions or looking at, you know, <clears throat> especially if you talk to converts, right? Many converts who come to Islam, this is one of the, the beautiful qualities that they love about Islam is that the door of knowledge is never shut on them. That they're never told, don't ask. We say ask, but ask the right sources. So I would say take your question to the, the appropriate person and say, you know, this is, can you please help me with that? And inshallah, you will, um, you'll have tawfiq, as long as your intention is, is sincere. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and move on to fear of poverty. This is on page 41. <laughs> 
So uh, verses 75 to 77. <clears throat> Fear of poverty originates in having a bad opinion of God, the exalted, and its cure is in having a good opinion. And knowing that what God possess, possesses is never diminished in the least by his expenditure from it, and that what has been apportioned to you will reach you inevitably. One who uses his religion as a means of benefiting his worldly condition is a sycophantic hypocrite in his transaction and he ultimately shall be the one defrauded. So the next spiritual disease Imam Maulud discusses the fear of poverty. Scholars have said that nurturing this fear is tantamount to harboring a negative opinion about God, the exalted, who has revealed Satan threatens you with poverty and he command, commands you to immorality, but God promise you, promises you his forgiveness and bounty. So one of Satan's tactics is to keep people uh, is so occupied with fear of losing their wealth that this culminates them in desperately clinging to their money and depriving the needy and themselves of the goodness of giving for the sake of God. So, again, thinking about, um, you know, having a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing that, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, everything is, your risk is, is determined, it's already predetermined, and you, we all will get every single thing that's portioned out for us. Um, when you have that type of conviction and clarity, then you don't have, you're not afflicted with this disease. But if you always fear that, you know, whenever you give, you know, and we talked about this, we touched upon it lightly when we did bukhal, right, miserliness. If you feel that when you're giving, you're losing, this is what's going to, you know, you know exacerbate this disease, right? Because it's like, oh my God, every time I write a check or have to make a donation or give a sadaqah or zakat, um, you know, it's, I'm taking away from my wealth. Uh, this will make you want to cling on to it more and eventually not give, right? And this is what people who are afflicted with this end up doing. They're so afraid of being impoverished. And maybe, be, maybe there is a reason for that. Maybe they came from a life of, of you know, impoverishment at some point. Um, or they just really love their wealth. It, it could be many different situations. But when you have that fear, then yeah, you won't, you won't end up giving at all. And it will cause you, um, you know, problems in your, uh, in your life, uh, spiritually, because likely you'll do other things too. Not just not give, but you might even engage in certain wrong actions or wrong things to get more wealth, right? You have such a fear of, of poverty that you're willing to uh, maybe compromise your principles, your morals, your ethics, the law. You know, people do this all the time. They do illegal things because they're so afraid of, you know, not having the wealth that they have or losing their wealth um, that it, it t sends them down a really, you know, slippery slope there, a negative path. So, um, you know, on the next page, um, we have... Fear of poverty is an instrument of deception and a common cause of misguidance. <clears throat> the American humorist Mark Twain once remarked, I've had thousands of problems in my life, most of which never actually happened. A person can grieve over a plethora of concerns and problems that he or she may never have to face. These phantom concerns can be crippling. Wealthy people cannot be at peace if constantly worried about their estate and its potential loss. Many wealthy people enjoy no peace of mind and their li lives are rife with conflict, contention, and treachery. A hadith states that anxiety is half of aging, and another hadith states that righteousness will lengthen your life. One interpretation of this hadith is that people who are righteous do not suffer anxiety that tears down the body and mind. They are content to do good deeds, and they trust in God. It is usually the irreligious who are in a state of turmoil with hearts not at ease. So that's actually pretty profound, right? That if your, you know, love of dunya, fear of poverty, all of these diseases causes you this level of anxiety, it's clearly why, because you don't have trust in God. And that they go hand, parallel hand in hand together. If you don't have trust in God, then your mind starts to deteriorate, right? Causes you to be paranoid, causes you to create problems that are not real, and you, it just kind of, you know, it's like a domino effect. Everything kind of just starts crippling you. But you're filled with this state of agitation. So 
what kind of enjoyment of life is that? You know, to have um, wealth that you're so afraid of losing, you don't enjoy it, and to distrust everybody that comes in your life because you're worried that they're out to get you. You know, they want your money. Like it just, it's a horrible, you know, situation to be in, but it all stems from the same root cause, which is you do not have to trust in God, right? And so the opposite is also important to reflect on, that when you do trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you, no matter what's happening, right, if you lose your job, and alhamdulillah, I know people who are amazing, like they, they've been through a lot of hardships, but they have this absolute yaqeen. And when they speak, it's like, it's so palpable. You can feel it. They have no doubt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide. I have no doubt. And certain, and sure enough, you know, next week, the following week, a month later, um, they get, you know, an amazing opportunity. Uh, that's, you know, that's the hadith. I'm in the opinion of my servant, right? It's proof of that. If you have a weak opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will only be confirmed to you. So if you actually doubt that things will go your way and that, you know, thing, then that's what you're going to see your whole life. He'll confirm it for you because you have no faith in him. The opposite is true. If you have incredible faith in him and you have a good opinion of him and you always remember that even our hardships are meant, you know, for goodness. You know, there, there, there's a good underlying reason why we're going through those things, tribulations there's benefits to them in the world and in the next life, then you always have this positive lens with which you see your Lord with, and he will confirm that with you. He'll, inshallah, give you relief from your tribulations. He'll reward you with in other ways. It'll just, you know, manifest itself that way. Yes? Right. That's a very good question. I, and I'm glad you asked it because we definitely don't want to come across to say that believers cannot be afflicted with anxiety or that your iman is poor if you're afflicted with, with anxiety. These are, you know, uh, mental health issues and a lot of people suffer from these issues. And that's why, alhamdulillah, our deen is so beautiful because we have dua literally where the Prophet ﷺ gives us dua to ask Allah Subhanahu to protect us from anxiety and these are things that we should be doing every single day. So there are spiritual protocol that you can take but you know this is also important to mention that sometimes you might need to take a more medical or mental health you know route in terms of managing the anxiety but it is not a measure of one's spiritual state if you're afflicted with anxiety. So I want to make sure that's clear. This is more, it's just the dunya is a place where it induces anxiety. I mean, if we're being honest, look around. There's, you know, panic and fear. I mean, right now we got coronavirus. We got, you know, all these, like, the, the, the election year. There's just so much, you know, what's going to happen, uncertainty. That's a natural, you know, um, those are natural causes of anxiety. So it's not uh, to say that people who are anxious are, astaghfirullah, you know, they're weak in iman. No, it's just a matter of how do we manage and cope for some people. Like I said, you know, doing those spiritual uh, athqar, the du'as, the, are, are really beneficial. And I encourage everybody to look into having a practice. This is from our scholars. They teach us that we should always be doing a regimented, um, you know, uh, formulaic set of prayers called a, a, a wird, right? A wird or a rad. This is a litany of prayers that every single day you committedly say. And many of them include protective du'as uh, for physical, against, you know, physical harm, but also mental, spiritual, you know, well-being. So uh, being in the practice of that, you will find just, you know, I, I speak about this a lot and almost any time I have the opportunity, but in my own life, in my own family, this is how we start our day. Every single day, we have, alhamdulillah, you know, the, the Bluetooth speaker that goes through the whole house. And my kids know, as soon as you wake up, that's the first thing. You know, after you go to the restroom, whatever, you go out, play the wind. 
because we want to start our day off with obviously the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also protective du'as because the world, we're going to enter this place where we don't know what's going to happen, but if we take, you know, uh, the, the, the necessary precautions, then inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us protection and tawfiq. So we have to really give importance to, to, to saying our protective du'as. You know, I mentioned this even last week, being in a state of wudu. All of this stuff is very important. And if you don't want to be vulnerable to, um, to, to harm, then this is how we protect ourselves. These are prophetic guidance. This is prophetic guidance. It's, it's exactly what we are told to do. Not just pray five times a day um, and looking at, you know, the, the basic, you know, the five pillars as being the only, you know, you know, things that we do. No, there's more to that. We have daily du'a, daily adhkar. But all of those are because this world is a place that's going to cause anxiety and fear and all of those things. So how do, this is how we protect ourselves. Okay. Yes. Control, control, right? I mean, I think a lot of a lot of people who I, who have who are entrepreneurial, who are self-made, who are self-starters. That's you know a, a pretty common, I think, issue that they deal with is that they went through so much to get where they are. The idea of giving that up is panic-inducing, and it causes a lot of stress for them. So they hold on to that. You know, it's a bigger problem, but. Um, I would say, you know, gentle encouragement is really important because we have to have empathy. Everybody comes from a different place. You can be very practical and pragmatic and look at things from one lens, but if there's a lot of emotional, you know, baggage there or, you know, something that's deeper rooted, um, instead of, you know, coming at this like, you know, in a, in a practical, pragmatic way, I would do a more emotional, you know, appeal, you know, to, to really be empathic and say, listen, I know you've put your heart and soul into this, but, you know, let's look at the future and what's best for us, you know, we're, and I, I mean, it's interesting because I had a similar conversation with my husband this morning, not necessarily about work, but more about, you know, just management of our time, you know, and I was telling him, we both have to kind of look about, look at, look towards our health in terms of not just physical health and well-being, but also mental health and making sure that we aren't doing things that are um, compromising us and we're not even aware of it. Because a lot of conditions, you know, th there's no uh, symptoms and then all of a sudden you get a diagnosis and you're like, where did this come from? But the, the red flags were there and a lot of it is behavioral. For example, you know, I was telling him specifically about, you know, um, the phone, you know, and how we're so easily distracted by this thing. We, just, we were just having a conversation I said, you know, we don't even know long-term studies <laughs> you know, about what it's doing to our brains, but yet we're so tied to it. And I, you know, I do a lot of work, so does he. We're on our computers all the time, but I was like, we both have to scale it back because we don't know if it's compromising our mental health, you know. So I try, kind of tried to take a, an approach that was more, you know what I mean? We, we're, we're a team. I'm not pointing a finger at you. I don't think I know better. 
but in our interests, in the best interests of our well-being, our future, our health, maybe we should do the X, Y, and Z. I think, I mean, this is just general marriage advice, but I think anytime you're in a situation where your spouse and you are on a different page about something, um, it's much better to approach the problem from a we-centered place than a you, and I'm just admonishing you or direct, or, you know, I'm telling you, because nobody likes to be spoken to that way, right? No adult, especially, you know, it's just, you get to a certain age, you just, it's, it's uh, offensive, you know? Right, it feels disrespectful. Even if it's not with that intention, it just comes across like that. Like, I'm not a child, you know? I've, I, I've, I've worked for 50, 60 years, and now you're telling me that I'm doing it all wrong, like you're discrediting me. But we inadvertently, even without any uh, intention, uh, sometimes may give that impression. So I think it's really important to soften the language, to go back and to make this about both of us instead of you, right? And then when, if you come from that approach, hopefully he'll be more receptive uh, because the ego isn't standing in his way, you know? Uh, but it's a, it's a lengthier conversation. Maybe we can talk offline, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. Yes. I think so now. Righteousness will lengthen your life. That's no, beautiful, and I agree 100%. Istikhara is definitely something that we need to make use of. I mean, there were Sahaba who, they didn't make a decision without uh, doing istikhara. Like, it was that serious for them. But sometimes we only look at it as major decisions in life. But if we were to actually use um, it more, we would see, you know, the benefit of, of feeling just divinely guided towards something. But I think there should be uh, just a clarification I want to make because sometimes people have the wrong expectation of istikhara. For example, um, they think that istikhara is going to lead to the path of success that that particular thing should lead to. For example, I'll give like a marriage, you know, I've, many people uh, who complain about, you know, their marriages will say, but I made istikhara. Why am I miserable? Why, why, do I, why did I end up in a divorce, right? Because they thought istikhara meant if I, you know, made this dua that I was going to have the outcome that was the best in terms of the material, worldly outcome, right? But istikhara really is about what's best for me, you know, in terms of nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes you might have to go through a difficult path, right? Uh, and then you come out from that better, you come out from that closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to be very clear on the terms of istikhara, that when we're asking for guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're saying that if this is good for me in dunya and akhira, right, facilitate it for me. That, that, what does that mean in the long run? That doesn't necessarily mean it's always going to be cherry, a bowl of cherries and everything's going to be perfect, right? And it's going to go swimmingly. It could be that you're tested in that, but you come out, a much better person. Do you get what I'm saying? So I just wanted to, I like to always make that clarification because I think sometimes people don't, aren't, aren't informed about the, what a sahara really means. But I highly encourage absolutely doing it because we should uh, put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a, a, an incredible gift that we've been given um, and we should make use of it more. But is that clear for everybody? Yeah? Okay. Yes. Yeah, there's different, you know, interpretation. Or some people, they, they, you know, they say that you'll get, the, like, the inclination, like, towards one will increase. Or the, the path towards one will be more facilitated. Like, if, you, if you're really at a crossroads. Because that's what istikhar is about. It's about coming to a place where you truly don't know what to do. If you already have bias, it's not going to, you know, you're leaning towards one, right? So you're just, that's just confirmation bias. 
this is when you truly don't know. And you're saying, Ya Allah, let's say you have two job offers. They both look really good on paper, right? And it's like, I don't know what to do. Which one's going to be better for me in the long run? I need to make a stakhara. Okay, that's, that's a prime example of when you should make a stakhara. Uh, but if you're already like, hmm, you know, the stock options of this one <laughs> are really good, and I get, you know, this bonus and that, hmm, you know, you see, you already have bias. So you have to be really conflicted. But once you do that, you might find that all of a sudden, you know, your interviews for one job are going awesome, and things are just, you know what I mean? Like, things are going much faster, and... It's coming to a decision when you're at a real true crossroads without already bias towards one. You have to be really conflicted about what to do because you are putting your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, you know, some other, just to answer the, the first question you had, some people do say a dream could be revealed to you. So dreams might also reveal an answer to you. So the answer can come and sh take shape in, di in different forms. Um, yes, you had a question? Right. No, it could be anything. Yeah, I, I, she, she just, yes. Yes, absolutely, yeah. It doesn't have to be, I'm sorry. No, I'm glad you asked because I, I didn't understand it that way, but now I get it. It's not that it, you, you have to be necessarily, you know, in a difficult position between two things. It could be any guidance on any matter because doing something or not doing it is also a choice, right? So it could be two distinct choices or the choice of acting on something or not acting. But in, at, at the end of the day, it's really the same. It's that you're not clear about what to do. And you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to divinely guide you towards one. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for mentioning that. Okay. Alhamdulillah. So are we still in fear of poverty, right? Okay. <laughs> so again, the treatment for this would be to have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And, you know, just to further our conviction, the Prophet ﷺ said, Charity does not decrease wealth. No one forgives another, but that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases his honor. And no one humbles himself for the sake of Allah, but that Allah raises his status. Okay. And then in Surah the Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Take from their wealth a charity by which you cleanse them and purify them and invoke blessings upon them. Um, And then this is just another beautiful hadith. Um, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anh, said that the Prophet ﷺ was never asked for a thing by one uh, who may be a who may who was about to accept Islam, except that he would give it. A man once came to the Prophet ﷺ and he gave um, him a herd of sheep filling an area between two mountains. When that man returned to his people, he said to them, "Oh my people, embrace Islam." Muhammad gives like one who has no fear of poverty. Okay, so this is just a, an example of the Prophet's incredible faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he um, was always, we know, the most generous, but he was willing to give people to never, you know, um, you know, leave anyone with a with, uh, with feeling of, of sadness, uh, even, you know, something uh, of this magnitude, because he had incredible faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, you know, that it would be fine, that it would all work out. So this is the type of, the level of conviction we have to have when it comes to our wealth, when it comes to being generous, that inshallah we have that yaqeen that when we're doing things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's never a loss, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide, and that when our wealth, when we're giving, our wealth is being purified, and inshallah it will also be multiplied, right? Um, and that, that should settle. Right? But, but having a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really the, the cure for this disease. Okay. And that's mentioned on page 43, the treatment. The cure for fear of poverty is to have a good opinion of God. Um, God states, I do not desire from people any provision, nor do I desire that they feed me. This is in chapter 51, verse 57. People who harbor good thoughts about their provider deflect insidious whisperings about him and the subtle provocations that create irrational fear. His dominion is never diminished in the least when he gives to his creation all that they need. And if someone else is given more, one should not harbor bad thoughts towards that person. 
wholesome thoughts about God express themselves in one's contentment with what he or she has, and not in stretching one's eyes towards the assets of others. The Prophet ﷺ said, contentment is a treasure that is never exhausted. So alhamdulillah, just having, you know, being completely satisfied with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what he's given you, and knowing that it's always for your khair, inshallah. So the next chapter is a pretty lengthy one. Um, it's on ostentation. So this is on page 44. We'll read from verses 78 to 86. Its root cause is covetousness and doing good works for the sake of showing off. The cure for covetousness is also my cure for the next disease, ostentation. So roll up your sleeves if you want to set out and cure what is at the root of all of these diseases and what exacerbates them. I mean that showing off is one of the calamities of the heart whose definition is to perform an act of devotion for other than the Creator's sake. Rather, it is for the purpose of seeking some worldly benefit or praise from His creation, or to protect oneself from the opposite, that is, the loss of wealth or dispraise. The worst form is that which results in a sinful deed, such as pretentious display of virtue, so as to be entrusted with the wealth of an orphan. The next degree is what is done for some worldly matter, using good deeds as a means to obtain it. Finally, showing off is that which is done out of fear of the scornful gaze of people. It is cured by knowing that if all of creation were to join forces to oppose you or support you, they would not be able to do so, except by his permission. Indeed, he alone possesses rewards for your actions in both abodes, and he is all-powerful the ever righteous and thankful. So this disease, ostentation riya in Arabic, is the most nefarious form of which is when a per, of which is when a person performs rites of worship merely to obtain a place in the hearts of others. In plain terms, it is showing off, doing something to gain notoriety. The Prophet said, referred to this behavior as the lesser idolatry, the lesser shirk. He also said, I do not fear that you will worship the sun, the stars, and the moon but I fear you're worshiping other than God through ostentation. And he, then he said, moreover, what I fear most for my community is doing things for other than the sake of God. So this is very serious. I mean, those words right there should really, you know, sting in a way like, I mean, subhanAllah, may Allah protect us, but what I fear most for my community, right? Um, this is clearly a warning for us that we have to check our intentions constantly because this is where we're going to get in trouble. We could be doing a lot, and there are people who are doing a lot, but if they're not clear on their intention, it's all for naught, right? It's all for nothing, and it actually could show up really harming them on the Day of Judgment because it's like your intentions were not ever for what you thought they were, and so you come up empty-handed thinking all these years I spent worshiping, I did this, I did that. But if it was at the end of the day, just so that people could look upon you and praise you and say, oh, wow, you know, look how much knowledge he has or she has. Uh, you know, look how much they, they're always at the masjid. They pray so much or they read Quran so beautifully. Um, you know, they have this and they have that. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something that um, we have to really think about. And I'll tell you personally, when I first came to the dean, this was a, a disease of the heart that I never studied this text until, you know, maybe two or three years into the dean is when I learned of it. Um, but for those first few years, I was very active. You know, I did a lot of public speaking. I was, alhamdulillah, president of the MSAs. I was just, you know, doing this and that and this. And I remember I joined a, a halaqa, a sister's halaqa at UC Berkeley, and there were some sisters there who, we st we were just, you know, new. We don't, I, don't, I don't think anybody really knew what we were doing. We were just kind of happy to do it together, I guess. But they were very, um, you know, we were always building each other up. So I remember getting a lot of, you know, comments about certain qualities I had. In particular, um, reciting Quran. They always wanted me to lead the prayers. And I remember, you know, really enjoying it, you know. And I just was like, oh, this is fun. And I thought, it's not, there's no harm, you know. I'm reciting the Book of Allah. I'm getting all these pra praise and accolades. 
And then I remember we got to a point where we started competing with Quran memorization. Um, and so we were like, I think winter break happened, it was around December, and we were going to come back and see, you know, who had memorized the most Quran. It was a few sisters who were, who were kind of competing. But in that time is when I, um, I believe I, I came across Sheikh Hamza when he was teaching this class. And I remember either it was this class or it was another class, but he definitely talked about ostentation. And I remember sitting in that class just so, I mean, incredibly embarrassed and humbled, but just like shocked because I never realized that all those years and all those efforts, it was really about the praise of people, right? Um, and, you know, he, he made a lot of comments that, that day that sort of stayed with me. One thing he mentioned, which I, I always like to point out, is that there's, it's a twofold thing because showing off is, is, you know, when you're actively doing something, right? If you actively do something so that someone recognizes you doing that thing and then they make a comment, that is the absolute definition of riya. But there's also another manifestation of riya, which is when you prevent yourself from doing something because you think people might think you're showing off. Right? So when he mentioned that, I was, my mind was blown. Like, what? Like, it's so, when it says nefarious, that's what it means. It's so sneaky. It's such a subtle disease of the heart. Because you think, okay, yeah, okay, I, I'm not going to show up. I'm not going to actively do something. But if you ever stop yourself from doing something that's beneficial, because you think, oh, people are going to think, oh, here she goes again, or here he goes again. He's showing off. That is also Ria. Why? Because in both cases, your preoccupation is with people. Do you get it? That's the bottom line. When we say the lesser shirk, it's because you're not even thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? You're thinking about either the praise of people or the scorn of people. Do you get it? So that's why it's very sneaky. And that's why we have to constantly check our intentions. So when I left you know, that ga this class at Sheikh Hamza and we went back to the halaqa, I just, I because I, 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 I knew I needed to work on this, I, I just said, I'm, I'm not going to lead prayers for a while, you know, I'm not going to do that until I cleanse myself from this because I, I, I just, I recognized it so much that all those years, it's like, astaghfirullah, what a waste. What a, may Allah, you know, I hope he still accepts my efforts because I was ignorant, you know, right? We have to have hope, you know. We should never despair. Um, but I do look back on those years and stuff a lot. So, alhamdulillah, since becoming aware of it, this is why, and I say it all the time, you've got to check your intentions. If you do anything, what am I doing it for? Who's, who's, who matters right now in, in this scenario, you know? Who am I thinking about? What, what comes to the forefront of my mind when I think of doing something? Is it, you know, people, you know, or is it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And that's how you, you know, check yourself. Yes, do you have a question? Right, you're worried and, and having, you know, those thoughts. No, it's, it's a good question. And I think, uh, you know, whenever you're in those situations where you're being put on the spot to talk about yourself, I know socially it's not comfortable, right? Because especially, and I think in certain, like, there, there are studies that say this too, um, women tend to have a harder time accepting, like, you know, or, or being more open about what they do or, you know, making sort of statements about their achievements and accomplishments because we're, you know, conditioned differently. Whereas for men, it's a lot easier. Men are, are more open. Like, yeah, I got my degree here and I did this and I did that, you know, and they're kind of like, because, you know, it's just, again, the way that we're socialized between the genders. So there's a gender difference there. But I think, again, when you're thinking about trying to remove this disease of the heart, you want to think about what is my, the intention. If I'm honestly just answering a question someone's asking me, 
and I'm just being honest about it without, you know what I mean, doing a humble brag or, you know, kind of throwing other things in there, <laughs> you know. If someone's asking about your career and then you, you're going off into 10 different tangents about other things you've done, yeah, maybe you're showing off a little bit. But if you're just, it's very matter of fact, you know, and you're answering because someone asked you, your intention is clear. You're just being truthful, right? So I don't think you should overthink it to the point where it's like, uh-oh, you know, I, I'm freezing and I can't, you know, I don't even know what to do. More like every situation is different, but if I'm ever presented with that, you know, question about an accomplishment or in any way a skill set that I have, that I just approach it as a matter-of-fact thing. And I would also say, you know, if someone can, you know, because people are generous sometimes and flowery with their responses and they want to, you know, praise you and, oh, wow, wow, you know, that you just say, alhamdulillah, like it's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and recognize truly, genuinely that it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you take on your, your skills, your qualities, your traits, your talents, as though you had anything to do with it, that's a problem because you really didn't. It's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every good that we have is from Him and it can be taken away like this. So when you really, truly understand that, then you deflect praise appropriately. You don't sit with it and you don't uh, encourage it and you don't, you know, relish in it because it's, it should, you, we should get to that point where it's, it's almost uncomfortable, you know, when people are praising you. That's a good sign. If you find discomfort, right, like, I don't want to hear that, you know, uh, because it's uncomfortable, alhamdulillah, then you have the right, but if it's the opposite where it's like, yeah, you know, keep giving me that, then it's maybe because you do attribute your good qualities to yourself. And that's a whole other conversation, right? Yeah, so I think just being very matter-of-fact, answering questions honestly, purifying your intention, I'm not trying to show off here, but not running away from those questions because that's also awkward too, right? <laughs> yeah, yes. That's what I was just describing, right? There's a discomfort because you know that it's not you. Like when people praise you, and you see people taking compliments for like beauty <laughs> or like their looks. I'm like, really? You had literally nothing to do with that. Nothing. Like, you know, if Allah found that I gave you Jamal, that, give it to your parents, if anybody, you know, but even they had nothing to do with it, you know what I mean? It's all from Allah. But some people will be like, oh, yeah, I know, like, thank you. And you're just like, stop all that. Like that's that's a prime example of really delusion. But if even your um, your accomplishments, if we're truly being honest, you could keep going back and just connecting the dots of every single person or event in your life that opened opportunity for you to do what you've done. It all goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he had not given you the family dynamics, the socioeconomic dynamics you had, you know, all those you know, privileges that you've been given, the time that you were born, the, you know what I mean, the, the, all of that, um, you wouldn't be where you are. So we just have to be humble enough to admit that our khair and our good, you know, qualities or whatever achievements we have, really every single one of them goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that when people are praising you, it, it, it should give you that level of discomfort. It's a good sign. But I would say, like I said, just, you know, alhamdulillah, mashallah, it's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Learning to respond in that way, where it really lets the person praising you know, you know, it's misplaced, you know. Uh, I get you're being kind and generous right now, just socially, that's what we do. But at the end of the day, you should know, because I know, it's not me, it's him, right? And that's just kind of where you leave the conversation. I'm sorry, was there, did you have your hand? Yes, and then I'll come to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's, you know, it's their prerogative. Some people, they might have had really, you know, difficult situations and they're paranoid. Maybe they just got the job and they're scared, like, oh, my God, if I say too much about it. So we have to also be willing to just see people where they are at. And if someone just doesn't want to disclose, I'll leave them not to pry, because that's another problem. I think we also 
like get offended, right, if people don't share. It's like, well, I just told you where I work. Why don't you tell me where you work? You know, this is an unfair conversation. But we have to have the emotional intelligence to read every situation and say, you know what, I'm comfortable. Alhamdulillah, I feel grounded. I feel stable in my position. I am confident in stating it. But I can't expect that from every single person. And if I pick up a hint of hesitation or fear or trepidation, I just respectfully move on instead of making it awkward and really like that's what do you mean Menlo Park you know <laughs> you don't I, yeah because I've seen people in those situations feel very offended by that and I think that's just not being fair people are at different stages but I'm glad you brought that up because it's a good reminder to know how to act in those situations you know for yourself but also to respond to other people yes Right. And it's actually addressed in the text, but I'm glad you brought it up. If you're going out of your way to avoid to be seen, there should be a level of balance because sometimes you're, if your intentions are again are in the right place, like, well, let's say you have a group of friends and you pray, but maybe they don't all pray. If you're like, well, I don't want them to know I pray because I don't want to seem like I'm showing off, right? In that scenario, yeah, that's that, that might help you, but wouldn't it be better for you to say, hey, Allah, Allah knows my intention, like, I want them to see me because maybe it'll encourage them, right? So that's different. Exactly. So that way it's that way. So this is where you have to discern every situation is different. If there's an opportunity to teach, to guide, to help encourage someone to do something good, then in that opportunity, you might not need to worry about being seen. But when it comes to, you know, your regular practice, um, things that are, that you do, and it's actually mentioned in the text somewhere, I'm not exactly sure where, but if you're doing something regularly in public and you continue to do those at home, that's a good sign, right? It's like a balance. Like I'm not only doing things to be seen, or I'm not only, you know what I mean? Uh, there's a balance. I, I'm consistent, right? But um, I, I would say that it really has to do with the situation. But to check your intention and say, hey, is this a teachable moment? Could I potentially encourage someone to do something? If so, then it's OK if they see me, because that's my Nia. My Nia isn't to get their praise. I don't care if they praise me, right? So talk to yourself before that, before you make the decision. Um, for example, charity. Like, let's say you're at a fundraising dinner, right? And you have the means to give, and you're looking at all these people around you, and, you, and they're like, okay, anybody, you know, can anybody donate this amount? And no hands go up. But you're like, you know what? Maybe if I do it, and I, you know, my friends will see me, or people will see me that are at my table, maybe they'll feel inclined to do it, and Shala will get this go ball going. I'll get, you know, the reward of, of all of their good deeds. Allah, you're the most generous. I'm going to raise my hand first. You see, what, where's your intention? Your intention is to say, I'm trying to benefit everybody, benefit this effort that's happening, and I'm not doing it because they look at me and go, oh, he's so generous, right? So a lot of it really has to do with that internal dialogue. And if you can um, play it out and, and really be honest with yourself, then inshallah, be confident that that sincerity that you're, you know, speaking to yourself about is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is going to reward you for. You can't uh, hide something from him, right? So if it's true that you're doing it for that intention, inshallah, you'll get that reward, right? And that's why in al-amana biniyaki, it's so important for us to remember. Um, but, you know, the, the other um, part, or, I mean, this is such a lengthy text, mashallah, there's so much benefit. I hope you all read this. But, you know, the other... The thing, important thing to mention is also to increase our good deeds in private. If you really want to protect yourself from this disease of the heart, don't be the person who's only super Muslim in public spaces, you know. Uh, be the person who is actually, you know, really mindful of God totally when you're by yourself. You know, you're in the car, um, you know, and you have time to, to be by yourself and you have choices to make. Am I going to, you know, pop in a CD and listen to music or am I going to, you know, listen to Quran? Make those decisions based on, you know, your true self, but don't be the person that 
when your friend gets in the car, CD goes to Quran, you know, and it's like, yeah, let's just listen to Quran right now. <laughs> it's like, okay, yes. Right. Right. That's a very good question. And I think we do have to honor our, you know, our natures because there are times where other factors are at play. Maybe you're tired. You know, maybe, this is where self-awareness, self-knowledge, being really caring about oneself to make sure that you are always your authentic self is that is important. Because if you ever do something for fear, again, of what people will say, what people will think of you, you're not being your authentic self, right? You're compromising. And then what that could do is backfire because it could make you have, uh, you know, shaitan, this is how he works. He gets in our mind. So it's like the association with that action becomes negative all of a sudden, right? All because you capitulated to a situation you didn't want to do for the sake of others. So I'm a big advocate of really being authentic with yourself and saying, if I need a time out today, like, you know, I've been going to the masjid for the whole week, but today I'm exhausted and I would actually much rather and benefit more from being at home. I'm going to, I'm going to rise. I mean, I'm going to, you know, have the courage and not have blameworthy modesty and say, I can't make it to the masjid today. You see, because you're, you're, at, you're, you're, um, you know, advocating for yourself in that situation, but also you're protecting yourself, you know, from, from uh, residual harm or from, you know, harm that could come later when you suddenly are like, no, I don't even want to bother anymore. Or I want to drop out of going to this youth group altogether because the pressure is so difficult. I, I don't want to deal with it anymore. You see, now it's like all or none, right? And that's exactly what shaitan does is he can overwhelm us to push us away completely. So you have to know if you are ever overwhelmed in doing something, that that's also one of his tactics. Sometimes we get into this binary where it's like shaitan only inspires to evil. But that's not true. He could tell you to do something of lesser good or he could keep pressuring you because he knows your nature and you'll burn out real fast, you see? So that's why you have to have that self-awareness that says, I know my limits and I'm gonna just, no, this doesn't work for me today. And, and have that constant, um, and for me, it's always about I want to be true and honest and authentic as much as possible because that is the prophetic model. The Prophet ﷺ was the most authentic, consistent person, and that's what we should aim to be. When we fear other people and what they're going to think of us, this is when we compromise that authenticity, and then it plays out in other, you know, it, it harms us in other ways. So it's a very good question. Thank you for, for asking that. Are there any other um, questions? There's much lost so much here. Um, the treatment on page 48. Being aware of the harm associated with ostentation is an effective treatment in itself, since it is human nature to avoid what invites harm. A show-off is invariably discovered, humiliated, and then scorned, and ultimately he is bankrupt because insincerity is not acceptable to God. This is a theoretical treatment that staves off all sensation. The practical treatment involves intentionally veiling one's actions from the eyes of people. So again, increasing your 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 you know deeds in private. So that first section, you know, just to be aware, like people don't like the show off. You're probably that person if you are the one who humble brags a lot or who name drops, you know, who shares, overshares when you're only asked one question. <laughs> you're giving way too much information. You probably are that person that people are internally rolling their eyes at and likely even talking about. So socially, you're not doing yourself any favors by being a show-off. Nobody, no matter how accomplished they are, um, likes, likes that quality in a person. But also, 
you know, your insincerity uh, is is not acceptable acceptable to Allah subhanahu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's, to me, the greater deterrent, right? Like, astaghfirullah, that you would, you know, and there's that hadith, right? The hadith that the Prophet says there are three people who on the Day of Judgment, you know, come and they, they're expecting all of this reward, right? The the man who uh, gained knowledge, the martyr, and then the, the, the wealthy person. And they all come expecting the reward for what they did because, you know, the knowledgeable person, well, I gained knowledge so that I could teach. And the response they're given is, no, you didn't. You did it for so that people could tell you, that you, say that you're the most knowledgeable and you fought in the battle and became a martyr so that they praised you and that you gave your, from your wealth so that they could say you were the most generous. Jaza'un wifaqa. You got the reward for what you did. Do you get it? You got the reward. The reward was the praise. That's why you did it. You got that reward. So astaghfirullah, they end up coming on the Day of Judgment totally empty. And that's like the worst scenario imaginable. And that's why you know this, we have to take this disease so seriously. Because the idea of working and toiling away and doing all these good works and then to come up on that day and have it all rejected, astaghfirullah, like that is terrifying, right? That no, because we didn't do the internal work of checking that intention, right? So checking the intention is very important. But the other practical treatment, which is mentioned here, is intentionally veiling your, uh, you know, deeds, you know, from other people. In in in, and this could be, you know, when you're if you're in, you know, a space, a public space, you know, you don't need to always um, do things openly, but also to increase your your private, you know, deeds, what you're doing at home. If you're someone who, inshallah, memorizes Qur'an or prays, you know, then those should be things that you do in the privacy of your home um, on a larger scale than doing it in public spaces, right? So just thinking about that, like what's the, you know, how much am I doing in public versus how much am I doing at home? And if there's more effort at home, Inshallah, you're less inclined to be afflicted with this. But if you're doing more in public and less at home, or you get lazy at home, right, then this is a problem. Like if you have guests over and it's like every prayer, the adhan, you're reciting it, and it's like, let's do jama, and it's like, you know, right on time because you want to, you know, impress your guests and you want them to know that you are a house that prays. But then when they leave, that fajr alarm could be going off for like 10 minutes and you're snoozing it and, and you know, and then you miss it, stuff like that. That's a sign. There's definitely a yeah there, you know. Um, and then there's, um, you know, it's recommended to recite often Surah Al-Ikhlas which affirms the oneness of God and negates the possibility of there being anything comparable to him. So, you know, this idea of lesser shirk, we want to constantly re realign our intention, reaffirm our intention that it's with, that it's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So asking Allah for sincerity, to increase us in sincerity, uh, is very important. As for one's piety, it can never be pure unless free of ostentation. In the Qur'an, there are two words that point to sincerity, mukhlas and mukhlas. The latter is the active participle, which indicates that the agent of purification is external. That is, that it is a blessing from God. Imam Ibn Qayyim al jawziya a 13th century scholar, said that if possible, it is possible for anyone to have sincerity in what one does and in what one believes, irrespective of creed. However, being mukhlas, purified by God, is reserved for those who have a system of belief and deeds that are concordant with what God has revealed. God loves this kind of human being. Imam Abu Hassan al-Shadri, a 13th century scholar, once prayed, O oh God, make my bad actions the bad actions of those whom you love, and do not make my good actions the good actions of those with whom you are displeased. So having that understanding, like you could be sincere, but if you want to have that attribute of being a mukhlas before God, that can only be attained by making sure that everything you do is in concordance with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And so, um, because that, that's a quality that only he can give you. 
And then he recommends uh, memorizing Sayyid al Istighfar, right? Which is a beautiful dua. Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa anta khalaqtani wa ana abduka wa ana ala ahdika wa abdika ma istatat. Audu bika min sharri ma sanat. Abu laka bi ni'matika alayya wa abu bi dhanbi. Faqfir li fa innahu la yaghfir al-dunubi illa anta. And that's in the English translation right there. But the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever says this when he arises in the morning and again in the evening and then dies either that day or that evening will enter the garden. I mean, that's so powerful. How, how you know, we, we have to take these uh, advices literally, like, to say that. And that's why the wird, which I mentioned earlier, if you do the wird al-latif by Imam al-Haddad um, or al-Ratib, inshallah, I think they both have this, but this is one of the du'as in that wird. But these are standard like you, we should all know this dua and say it every day because of this promise I mean, what an incredible promise like we don't know when we're going to die but if i say this every day subhanallah <laughs> i'm protecting myself and i'm uh, insured the garden why wouldn't i do that right so we have to really give um this weight and then if we go to page 50 in um Oh, I'm sorry, the verse poems underneath that. We'll read that first, 49. Scholars are of two opinions about, about seeking some benefit in this life through worship as opposed to seeking only the hereafter or even seeking the hereafter or, or worship seeking its delights. Is it sincerity or showing off? Some also consider that merely taking delight in people's awareness of one's actions is showing off, though the star, Imam Malik, did not consider that harmful as long as the original intention was based on the foundation of sincerity. So this is a really good discussion, the rest of the text here that talks about, you know, um, about doing things uh, for, like, your objective, right? If you're worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, what is your objective? Is it to gain his pleasure, to gain Jannah and all of the bounties of Jannah, or to protect yourself from the hellfire? Like, where, w does that in any way... Uh, compromise one's sincerity. So it's a really good discussion on that topic. And I, again, encourage, I hope all of you read read that. Um, but on page 51, on the third chapter there, the distinctions are made, right? Imam al-Ghazali says that there are three types of people, those who worship God freely, ahrar, and they do so only for the sake of God and his pleasure. Included in this type are those who are diligent in their worship to fulfill their covenant of obedience to God. The second type is people who worship like merchants, tujar, right? Looking to get something out of their worship. For example, a person of this type prays a certain number of prayers in order to receive a known reward, such as a palace in heaven. Finally, the third type is those who worship like slaves, abid. They do it out of the fear of punishment, specifically fear of hellfire. So, you know, you kind of got to figure out where are you, right? Where are you at? Um, what would... What, what, how do you, how would you define your level of worship? Um, but yeah, there's, it's, there's a lot of content there, mashallah. Very interesting discussion. Um, I wanted to talk about the point that the Imam Malik made. I'm trying to find that text. So there's difference of opinion. He mentions that on page 52 and 53 between the scholars in terms of, you know, whether or not something is shirk in terms of, you know, outward action. Um, so Ahmed ibn Abi, Abi al-Hawari said that whoever loves to do something and loves to be known for it has committed idolatry, shirk. Um, Imam al-Jazuli said that a person may engage in blameworthy ostentation even if no one is there to notice. So you see there's a lot of commentary from different scholars on what constitutes ostentation. Like even if nobody's there, but you still have the wrong intention, you could still be afflicted with this disease, right? So it's not necessarily that you are seen by other people, but just having that desire itself is also a sign of the disease, right? Um, and then... He refers to Imam Malik on the very bottom paragraph, and he calls him Al-Najm, the star. Um, he says, if we speak of scholars, Imam Malik is the star. Okay? And then Imam Abu Hanifa, he's called Imam al-Azam, right? The greatest Imam. Um, or all them, uh, Imam Malik did not consider that epithet harmful. 
as long as the original intention was based on the foundation of sincerity. Okay, so then I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, the next section is what I wanted to read. Imam Malik was once asked, what do you say about a man who walks to the mosque for the sake of God, but then on the way there thinks to himself, I hope someone sees me walking to the mosque. <laughs> so I love this section because I think it gives us all hope. You know, as we said, this is a really sneaky um, disease of the heart, but we don't want to get too, you know, uh, like um, paranoid and, and, and start thinking our, our every action and deed is our intentions are off. Because he, he gives us hope here. He says, Imam Malik did not see this as harmful as long as the man started out with sincerity and then wards off such whisperings. So if you're... If your intention was not that, but then Shaitan inserted that thought somewhere along the way, as long as you say, you know, you're not afflicted with riyad. Do you get it? So it's 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 a matter of uh, where you what you do with those thoughts, right? Um, if it and it should make you uncomfortable, and you should you know seek refuge from those thoughts. But if you started off with total sincerity, you wanted to do something for the sake of Allah, um, not to punish yourself or be too hard on yourself just because those thoughts enter your mind. And now you're thinking you're this horrible person, you're so insincere, and you're sh you're committing shirk. No, because it's waswasa, you know. This is how shaitan works. He wants to chip away at our sincerity. So he'll insert thoughts. It's inspiration, right? And so you have to know that's not originally for me because I didn't even think about that. It's now that I'm in the middle or I'm in the process or if I'm on my way to do it that it suddenly occurs to me 100% waswasa. Right? So it gives us hope there, alhamdulillah. And then Imam Maulud says that abandoning a good act out of fear of ostentation is worse than engaging in an ostentation itself. So this is really important, what I said earlier, right? The two sides, the two, it's like there's two sides to this. If you just abandon the act altogether, this is worse because now you're cutting off good for yourself and maybe for others if they are going to benefit from that all because you're too worried uh, about something whereas if you just you know did it uh, pushed past it um, for the, and, and purified your intention inshallah then uh, it benefits you and and others so um, one should not submit to an irrational fear that is perhaps inspired by evil whisperings and thus deprive oneself of the blessings of, for example, congregational prayer. It is better to continue with one's good deeds and to work to keep one's intentions pure and sincere. So I remember he, um, yeah, that was mentioned then back then too during that class, that if you have the thought of not wanting to do something for fear of ostentation, the response should be to do it anyway, okay? So don't capitulate to that thought, like, oh, people are going to think I'm a show-off right now. I shouldn't do this. No, do it anyway, because what you're doing is you're kind of like um, pushing that thought out of your mind about other people and hopefully keeping to your original intention, which was for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Is that clear? Any questions about this? And what is our time looking like? Okay, so I just wanted to read from notes here. Okay, so I'm that it's all. We've covered it all. Oh, this is also uh, chapter 18, verse 110. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, Whoever would hope for the meeting with his Lord, let him do righteous work and not associate in the worship of his Lord anyone. So just another reminder about really purifying our intentions. Um, to make sure that it's never there's it's never stained or tainted or mix you know there's mixed intentions of trying to please other people or get praise from other people that we really truly are just concerned with Allah's Father's pleasure with us. Okay. 
the last section is really beautiful because it kind of just puts it all in perspective for us, right? Page 54. The essential point about worship is that it should be done purely for the sake of God. When one cleanses the soul of anything that tarnishes one's intentions, one's knowledge of God will increase. As a consequence, everything else in the world will grow insignificant. Imagine how awestruck the Prophet ﷺ must have been when he saw Angel Jibreel ﷺ in his true form, his majestic wings filling the horizon. Then imagine worshipping God, the eternal, the infinite, the glorious. To worship God as if one sees him is a characteristic of excellence in worship, ihsan, as the Prophet ﷺ taught us. Seeking to impress humans is a pathetic exercise, an utter waste of time and life. For humanity is in constant and total need of God. If one wants to be close to power and authority, then one should not chase men of position and station. Rather, one should seek closeness with God, the master of the universe, the creator of all things. There is absolutely no power or might except with him. So that's a, a really beautiful ending, right? Just gives us all perspective. All right, alhamdulillah. Let's go to relying on other than God, inshallah. Verses 101 to 105, this is page 56. Fear of and desire for other than my Lord contradicts absolute trust in him, the origin of both of them. And I seek refuge in the mighty from every disease is lack of certainty. What is prohibited from the two is that which prevents an obligation from being fulfilled. As for it leading to the neglect of that which is recommended, then it is considered reprehensible. In any case, flee in fear to your Lord from both of them. The cure for both is to know that there is none who can bring benefit or harm other than him alone. So fearing or desiring anything other than God runs contrary to trust and reliance on God. Tawakkal. If one is obsessed with other mortals, his or her reliance on God is weak. This diminishes one's certainty, yaqeen in God, and certainty that everything good, all that is worth, worthy of pursuit and time, comes from none other than God. The cause of many diseases of the heart can be traced back to a lack of certainty and an impaired sense of faith and trust in, in God. A person can be in pursuit of attaining benefit from people and fall into the trap of neglecting his obligations, as well as those meritorious acts that invite untold blessings and dimensions of realizations to one's life. One needs to seek refuge in God from the kinds of fear and desire that divert one's attention and striving away from God. The Imam's admonition is to always keep in mind that God alone holds all benefit and that only God tests people and provides relief and provision. So, again, I think this is very much tied in with what we've been talking about of having just a really positive and clear uh, understanding of of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and always purifying your intention uh, intention, and relying and putting your, you know, reliance on him, having that trust, whether it comes to, you know, fear of poverty or riya or anything. If we have the right understanding that of just uh, making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our focus, then we protect ourselves. But as soon as we shift our focus um, to other people, right, whether um, it's seeking their praise or uh, or relying on them too much, this is when we compromise our, our yaqeen, our faith in Allah. Um, and so really, w uh, whatever position you're in in your, in your life, just remembering that you can, you know, turn to people as a means of helping, but your first line should always be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are people, for example, who, um, they don't pray their five daily prayers, Right? but they are, you know, struggling and they're going from here to there and asking family members for maybe financial help or coming to the masjid and, you know, seeking assistance here or, you know, signing up for s certain programs. But then they don't pray, right? You see, that's a conflict because ultimately whatever situation you're in, if you want relief from that, the only one who's going to bring you relief is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So we have to, you know, know how to prioritize or, or how to, you know, which, which line of uh, course of action to take. And your first line is to seek, uh, you know, dependence on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why, again, 
increasing your du'as, increasing your prayers. Anybody who's in a difficult predicament, whatever it is, if you're in a marriage maybe that you don't know which direction it's going to go, and if you're financially having issues, if you're having health issues, you we have to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and increase our um, calling on Him. Because sometimes that's really what it's about. He wants us to call on Him. So waking up in the middle of the night, right? Increasing our dhikr and our remembrance. Um, all of that matters. We can't act like those are just voluntary deeds that we do. They're, they're means to an end. And the, the end is to draw nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to prove to Him that we do recognize who you are, that you, you know, dictate matters uh, that, you know, for us, and that you are who we should rely on. But if we're not doing that part, and we're running around scrambling, trying to find solutions to our problems here, and, you know, imposing maybe on other people, then we don't have a strong connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't have yaqeen that he can help us, right? There's definitely a disconnect there. Qualified scholars to talk to, because they can present the the whole topic for you. I wouldn't be able to do that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. Can you tell me the page or the reference to it? Okay. Sure. So you want more explanation on that? Sure. So it's more like, you know, those you love, th those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, their bad actions are probably on the spectrum not that bad, right? So instead of leaving me to my own devices, I don't, you know, I'd rather, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. With whom you are displeased. Because... Again, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is displeased with them, it's likely that their intentions are probably not, right? Like their intentions are probably not good or pure or they're, they're, they're doing something wrong. So even if they present as being good deeds, if he's not happy with them, that's a, that's a reflection that there's no sincerity there. Thank you. All right, so I think, inshallah, we'll, we'll stop here. We covered few, right? We got through. Alhamdulillah. Good. Uh, that's good. <laughs> I was like, we need to catch up, otherwise we're going to be really fall behind. So inshallah, we'll work on the displeasure with divine decree, because that's also a link for the end. Well, actually, I'm sorry, let me go to the contents, and I'll tell you for next week. Um, I try to, I'm trying to aim to do five to six if we can. So we'll do displeasure with divine decree, seeking reputation, false hopes, negative thoughts, and vanity. Let's just finish that first uh, content section, okay? So we'll go all the way to vanity for next week, inshallah. And as we discussed, if we find that we are, um, you know, we need more time, we're probably going to add maybe one or two more classes to this. I hope you guys, I hope that's okay, uh, inshallah. Okay, good. Yes. Uh, inshallah, um, Inshallah, it's all whatever, you know, we'll look at, because the way that programming is done at MCC is a lot of it, yes, is driven by what the community asks and needs, and if there are certain subjects or topics that you guys are interested in, then that feedback is really important. So if there's a specific text or topic that you are interested in, let us know, and we can explore options of myself or maybe a more qualified teacher. For this one, alhamdulillah, as I mentioned, you know, Sheikh Hamza did give me permission to teach this. So as long as I have the permission to teach, then we'll do it, inshallah. <laughs> there are, there's a lot. <laughs> inshallah, we will definitely, uh, look. I mean, I'm part of this community. I love this community. I love this community center. I'm always um, going to make myself, inshallah, 
available to serve it in whatever capacity I can. And if that means doing more programs like this, I'm happy uh, and honestly honored to do it. I'm honored that all of you are attending and that you come out on a Saturday. It's really jazak um, khairan. I'm very humbled and, and and I'm happy, as I said, to be to be here. So we'll see about doing more, inshallah. Are there any other questions about anything? Alhamdulillah. Yeah. It's the Arabic is man arafa nafsahu faqad arafa rabbahu. It's the exact same thing. The one who knows themselves will know their Lord, right? Right. Right. But you want a more, sure, I love, I think it's one of my favorite maxims. I quote it often because it really is, um, you know, it, it's it's the formula for success. If you want to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look at yourself first because there's a vast universe of design, right, that he has created us with that proves his existence. I mean, beyond the universe, the vis, you know, visible universe that we can see, just the human being um, and the way that we're operate the way we de were designed is just incredible you know and you can look at this from a physiological biological uh, thing but I also like to look at it from just personalities and temperaments I love studying you know human nature human behavior because there is um, just a profoundness about it that just says subhanallah you know I mean I I've con I think about for example there's what seven billion plus people on the planet it's isn't it fascinating from like just a, a statistical sort of lens to imagine that we all coexist relatively well you know there's conflict obviously there's human conflict but but people get married strangers complete strangers who don't know anything about each other and then they can have you know these incredible like love stories and relationships and then whole communities or you know families are, are Created from that and communities. It's just when you start thinking about how Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created the human being to be able to do that effectively, and then also, you know, just the amount of um, growth and and uh, you know development, uh, the knowledge that we've been given to be able to do certain things. It's really mind blowing. But reflecting on that on a macro level and a micro level will ultimately conclude. I mean, you'll come to that conclusion like, subhanAllah, Allahu Akbar, right? Because who else could have done this, right? This is just such a huge thing, you know, if you really think about all, all, of, all of these things. Again, from, from just focusing internally on the, on, on, the, on the design that we have physically, but also on what we've been able to achieve over a relatively short amount of time, it just brings you back to that conclusion. So it's tied. If you want to know your Lord, start with yourself. Start there. Think about how you have got here. Think about, I mean, for those of us who are mothers, life, you know, we brought a human being into existence, uh, the miracle of life, all of that, how we're, you know, it's just, it's just fascinating. So it's really a matter of, uh, it's a tool for contemplation, for thinking, for reflecting, that ultimately, um, as I said, brings you to that point of, Allah truly, subhanAllah. And the fact that we know our Lord in, in such an intimate way is so beautiful and such a gift, alhamdulillah, that we have to be grateful for. It. Because there's a lot of people who, they have such a limited lens of God, you know, and, and so it's so myopic, it's just so t tiny. They don't have a vast understanding of God. You know, even though they might understand, okay, he's the creator, but at, beyond that, what other tradition has a level of, intimate knowledge that we have, to know his attributes, right? And in addition to the Qur'an, which is obviously the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I love and I encourage highly for people to read the Hadith Qudsi because those are so directly, like it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally talking to us, right, in many ways, whereas the Qur'an is, you know, there's storytelling, right? There's a lot of other, you know, um, the way, the style, the style of the Qur'an. Whereas the Hadith Qudsi are very targeted, and you, I mean, if you if you read some of them, they're very very powerful. 
but I, I just feel like we have such a great knowledge of our Creator, alhamdulillah, and uh, we have to be very grateful for that. That this is why one of the du'as that we say or we should say is alhamdulillah, ala ni'mat al-Islam. You know, alhamdulillah for the blessing of being Muslim, really, and really like thank Allah because it's uh, it's such a it's the greatest gift that we've been given. Yes. Right. Well, you have to do the treatments. So that's what you have to do. It's not just a matter of diagnosing. you got to follow the, the, the plan, you know. So, and that's what we're doing here. We're, we're bringing, we're unearthing it. We're bringing it all out. It's uncomfortable. But at the end of it, it should be we're proactively trying to fix ourselves, right? Right, you start feeling so guilt. This, and for me, it's the toxicity of the lack of self awareness. Right, the dial back on yourself. And that's exactly the point of this. Because if you, that's why language is so important. Because language uh, helps us define things. So you might have all these things going on, but once someone points out what it is in clear terms, right, now it's something. Now I'm aware of it. Otherwise, it's just a passing, fleeting thing, or maybe I have no awareness of it. So when you study a text like this, it's, that's the power of it. It's like, oh, I now have terms that are clearly defining behaviors that I can see myself in. And now it's like a mirror. It's basically looking at a very, very clear mirror. And you can't, you know, hide, <laughs> uh, you know, when you're in front of a mirror. Some mirrors are very unforgiving. But, you know, it's better to see the flaw now, right? To me, that's what I'd rather be doing this now than, like I said, end up on the Day of Judgment, God forbid, surprise. And that's one of the, I think, names of the Day of Judgment. It's like the Day of Surprises. I'm like, oh, the because people come there expecting one thing, but then they get another. So we have to be very, astaghfirullah. A lot. I don't want to be surprised on that day. I mean, I want to be pleasantly surprised, you know. But I don't want to be blindsided surprised, you know. I don't want to be like, what? You know, astaghfirullah, like that, yeah. So, inshallah. Yes, I'm sorry, did I see a hand on the men's side? No? Okay, alhamdulillah. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Right. Right. Absolutely. And that's very, uh, that's on point. And, and that's exactly why self-awareness and doing all of this work is so important is because it's a reminder that we are created weak, that we do need our Lord. Without him, we, we don't have guidance. And so that's why, you know, attributing anything, even guidance to yourself is a huge flaw. Like guidance is directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just because you did hajj or you came from a good family or you wear hijab or you pray, you don't attribute that to yourself. It's from Allah, right? Um, and so every good is always brought back that it's from him. 
But the more aware you are of that, right, the more inclined you are to keep that connection very strong with him. And this is where all of these other things, like we talked about, the praise of people, the opinions of people, just really start to not matter as much. Because you realize, like, I just, I just need Allah's approval. I don't need anything else from anybody. And that, um, it, it, having that, subhanAllah, though, one of the beauties of doing that is it will take care of everybody else, you know. If you make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your focus and pleasing Him, all of your relationships you'll see, there will be facilitation in them. You won't be, you know, always between a rock and a hard place or, or struggling or doing this and that because He will start to make things easy for you. And that's why people of Allah are content. They have contentment. Even if they have hardships, they're just like, alhamdulillah. Because some, it's all taken care of some way. You know, either they, can, they have peace with it, whatever is going on, or Allah is facilitating it for them and they have ease, right? But when you align yourself with Allah, that's the, that's the, you know, uh, the consequence of that, is that he will improve things for you. But if you don't and you're too worried about other people, then you just, you know. So, alhamdulillah. All right, inshallah, we'll go ahead and end in dua. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu an la ilaha ila anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا عصر ان الانسان لفي خسر الا الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر جزاك الله خيرا ان شاء الله we'll see you guys next week